Hello and welcome to First Tuesdays, a monthly webinar offered by the Washington State Library. Um, my name is Tammy Masonheimer. I'm your facilitator and I'm also the training coordinator here at the State Library. This is my contact information if you have any questions or comments about our program or also if you have any ideas for future First Tuesday programs. Today we, um, Jeremy is our technical support person, is actually out of the office today and Joe Oliver is here to help you if you have any um, technical technical issues. Um, he will go ahead and type his contact information into the chat for us. And First Tuesdays is brought to you by the Washington State Library, which is part of the Office of Secretary of State. Our funder is the Institute of Museum and Library Services through the LSTA Act. And as a requirement of our funding, we're going to ask that you take a short four question survey that will appear when you close the window at the end of the presentation today. It's important information. We're going to use it for our annual report so we can continue funding for trainings such as today's. And we'll thank you in advance for your feedback. So today we have a really great presentation. I want to thank Joanne um, Merkert, Bruce Schneider, and Jason Eklund for taking time today to talk about bringing a geographic perspective to libraries in K through 12. At their request, questions may be entered into chat at any time and we can ask them as they go along. So I have some biographies for you. Bruce Schneider is the Washington State Department of Superintendent of Public Instruction, Geographic Information Systems Analyst and Developer. He has over 20 years experience as a GIS professional in the public and private sectors, including being an instructor. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Anthropology with that emphasis in GIS and archaeology from Central Washington University and the Master of Science in Applied Geospatial Sciences from Northern Arizona University with an emphasis in historical geography and archaeology. He's worked for environmental and engineering consulting companies in Seattle, Northern California, Las Vegas, and Wenatchee. He's also served as the GIS coordinator for Mojave County, Arizona for several years and he joined OSPI in 2018. Our second presenter, Jason Eklund, has been the GIS coordinator for Kittitas County for the last 12 years, where he manages the enterprise GIS data and software for all departments. He earned a BS in natural resource management with a minor in spatial information systems management from Colorado State University. With 19 years of professional experience in GIS, Jason's passion is workflow automation through application development and enterprise GIS integrations with other systems. In 2015, ESRI awarded Kittitas County with a special achievement in GIS for their use and incorporation of ESRI's local government solutions. And in 2017, won the first place at the ESRI User Conference Apps Fair for an application build using the ESRI Runtime uh, SDK for .NET. Jason is actively involved in the newly formed Washington Government GIS Leaders Group, a subcommittee of WAURISA where he serves as a board member and enjoys giving annual presentation to local schools on GIS Day. And then our third presenter, Joanne Merkert, Merkert, excuse me, Joanne, is the Washington State Geographic Information Systems, which is GIS coordinator. She's over 20 years experience as a geographer in the public and private sectors, including being an instructor. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Biology and Master's in Environmental Studies. She started her career in GIS at the Washington Department of Natural Resources. She then worked in consulting for 17 years on a variety of GIS and IT projects before returning to lead the geospatial program for the Washington Office of the Chief Information Officer. So um, I want to thank you, Joanne, Bruce, and Jason for joining us and talking to us about GIS. And Joanne, if you're ready to go ahead and share your screen, you can get started. Yes, thank you. <clears throat> Let's see, I believe it is now shared. Can you just confirm you can see it? Yes, we can see it. All right, great. Well, thanks everybody for being here. Um, I just really love geography and everything that touches it. And so when, when I'm working here at the state, so what does like a state GIS coordinator do, you might wonder. Um, so what I like to work on are larger projects where we look at this technology across the state when we're looking at what are counties doing, like what Jason's going to show you, what other state agencies are doing, such as what I will show you and what Bruce will show you guys today. 
and how to bring that together so that we are using this information in as many ways as possible and um, using it for the benefit of the state. So the interesting thing to me about bringing it into libraries is that you guys have so many different participants, you never know exactly who will be using some of your resources. And so I'm really glad that we have a chance to tell you a little bit more about this particular technology and how to bring geography to it. So I don't really know if you guys know what GIS is, so I thought I'd just step through a couple of uh, examples. So when we think of geography, it's really like, I figure you guys are librarians, it's really like any setting that you would find in your book. Um, there's always a place that things are happening. There's um, a setting for the characters. And as we look at Washington, as we look at problems we're trying to solve at the state, uh, they all have a setting as well. They have this geography. And while we used to have these really cool maps that were hand drawn and stuff like that, now it's really all done on computers. And while I don't have R2-D2 in my um, office or anything like that, but um, it really has become very computer-based. And so this kind of artistic endeavor that we used to think about, that we see the old maps of, um, that's now becoming much more computerized. So just some real world examples. So if you're down at Disneyland or if you're using Yelp or something like that, it's using, <clears throat> excuse me, some form of geography, some form of that uh, computer-based maps to help you find things. And it can be in little apps that you use on your phone. Uh, sometimes it looks like aerial photography, like maybe you would see on Google Earth or otherwise. That's actually the building I'm in right now is in that purple um, box. And we can use that for things like 911. We use it uh, in police cars. We use it for dispatching. We use it to map streams, uh, buildings, et cetera, land use patterns. Um, and so all of that information is things that we can gather from looking at the aerial photography. We can also look at estuaries. So we can really look at floodplains and how that looks relative to foothills. We use this for flooding. We use it for tsunami hazard, inundation evaluations. And the key is that all of this is tying into places that are actually on the ground. <clears throat> so it's not like fictitious. This is actually information that represents what we're seeing on the ground. And then you can start to compare them. So you could compare where there might be floodplains relative to buildings, homes, et cetera. Or out in eastern Washington, quite a lot of the fires where are wildfires relative to where people are, evacuation routes, that kind of thing. So it's really kind of all around us. And I think because we use geography just so innately uh, in our problem solving that we forget that putting it into computers takes quite a bit of time, that um, you can do all of this, a lot of it at your computers, at your laptop, in the field with your phone. And it takes a fair amount of effort to make that happen. So then GIS is really just taking that and putting it into the computers it's about the people, it's about the software, it's about the hardware that it takes to make that all happen. And really, GIS is just anytime you have the question of where. So, where are my libraries? Where are the customers that go to each of the libraries? Where are we um, having the most book club kits being checked out of? What are some of our uh, other parameters that we're interested in relative to our libraries, but it could also be that you could use it as research information to uh, help your patrons to figure out other questions that they might have. You know, where? What's the best location? How are these places related? How far apart are they? What kind of patterns can we see using the information? And then can we do any of that and make predictions about what we would expect to find in certain locations? So here's an example, a very simple example of how can we take a table. So this um, Excel spreadsheet kind of behind the scenes here is uh, just a table that I found out on a website. Um, and it has a lot of good information. It has our unemployment rate by county, but it was just a table. So then what happens when we put it on a map, right? Then we can provide a geographic perspective. So the darker colors is where we have higher unemployment. And then the lighter shades of blue and white are where we have less percentage of unemployment. And so now we can start to see regional trends. You know, how can this help us solve complex problems? Well, could we put on median 
um, incomes for these counties? Could we look at minimum wage in the counties, average rent, things like that? So then we can start to really make this more complex and really help to solve these problems. We also, because it's all computer-based these days, you can click on various counties and then you can see a little bit more. So you can dive into the map to look at some of the trends, patterns, and data that's um, underneath it. Some other examples, you know, GIS doesn't always look like a map. Those are the easiest times to figure it out and realize that it is a map. But it can also be in things like this, where we've got a screenshot here. Um, if you go to the Washington State Legislature and you're trying to find who your representative is, you would type in your address, because that's a location, right? And then who you are represented by is based on that. So when you click that information, it's doing a GIS check and then returning who your legislator is, as well as their email and phone number. So we can use it for that. We use it actually to make sure that ballots are getting to citizens because where you live depends on what ballot and what measures you're allowed to vote on. We use it in census and redistricting. So every 10 years, there's a census done by the federal government and that determines the population of the state of Washington and that in turn uh, helps us figure out how much money we're gonna receive from uh, the federal government for 10 years. It also determines whether or not we're gonna get uh, new representatives and how those districts look because it's based on population. So all of this is really important and it's all based on geography. So I thought I'd give you just a couple of quick examples of how do we apply this at the state of Washington. <clears throat> so on, in this example, this is by our labor and industries department. And what I like about this example is that it goes down to like the cubicle level. So like we can map down to the cubicle level, we can show where fire extinguishers are, how to get out of buildings. You know, frankly, some of our buildings here at the state are fairly large and being able to find the conference room or the person you're looking for can be a bit of a problem. Um, and also locating emergency uh, exits and um, assisting people when they need it. So you can go to different floors um, in the little screenshot that I have on the right hand side. There's five floors in this particular building. Um, all of this attaches to the HR so that we know who's in which cubicle, what kind of equipment they have. So then actually using it for asset management becomes a way that we can utilize this information. Another example is from our state ferries. So we have a marine mammal monitoring program that Washington State Ferries uh, conducts. So people are out on the shore and they are looking and spotting marine mammals because as they're doing ferry dock repairs and terminal repairs, they make a lot of noise. And it turns out that that is very disruptive to marine mammals. When they do that, um, they put it on a map. They used to do this all by hand and it took hours and hours and hours to be able to put it there. But by using some of this technology, they're able to much more quickly see the patterns of where are the marine mammals are on the map and then be able to respond to them. It's also saved the, the state tons of money uh, through not having to do duplicate data entry, et cetera. And they're able to share the information and that's kind of what we're gonna be showing next. So at the state, we share our information through what we call the Washington State, Washington Geospatial Open Data Portal. And this is where we share information out, both with each other at the state agencies and then with the public. Because really, when we save money, we're hosting it once, using it often, we're all using the same information, and actually we have ways that the county can participate as well. I'm gonna give you just a quick live demo of one or two items, and then I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Jason to show you some of the great things that they're doing at the county. So I'm going to take you through the dairies. So if you were to come out to this website, geo.wa.gov, you can explore data. We have over 600 different data sets that are out here that are all geospatially enabled. You would come to this page. I don't think this is intuitive, which is why I wanted to show it to you in person. You create a web map. Oh, and then you wait. Okay, 
then you get a map. I just click done here. But now you can start to interact with it. And you can zoom in and you can see where the dairies are in Washington in 2019. <clears throat> you want to see what the colors mean, you switch on the legend. You can also add additional layers from any of these other geospatial open data portals. So if I type in, I think it's Washington Parks. So then I can see the Washington State Parks, and then I can add them in, their trails. I'm not quite sure why I'd need to have dairies and trails on the same map, but the concept though is that you can start to combine this information, and who knows what you might need to solve or what problems you're trying to solve, but a lot of the data is out there. And when the Washington State is sharing this information, it's really you know, pretty close to authoritative information on where this is. Sometimes it's not always complete, but it is authoritative for what we have. <clears throat> so I want to take you back to the geo.wa.gov, and we have this ability to also share from counties, so that this is more of a one-stop shop for data that's available from the state for folks that are looking for and researching a variety of topics in Washington. So when you come to these, you click on, for example, a county. And then you can click on the more information. And then it opens it up into that county's ability to share information and geospatial data. So we have live links to as many counties as we can and a couple of the cities that you saw on that map. And so with this, I'd like to turn it over to Jason, who is from Kittitas County, and can tell a little bit more about some of the data that they're sharing on a local level and some of the questions that they're getting. Great, thanks, Joanne. Um, oh, it's a great uh, introduction into GIS. And I will. Okay, so um, I am the, the GIS coordinator for Kittitas County. And from more of a, a local perspective, I guess, um, the way that we share our information um, that differs from the state is uh, we, you know, go specifically down into the parcel level. So um, the way that we share this information out, um, Joanne talked about a little bit, um, getting that information and that data into the computer. And so each one of our departments are, are collecting and maintaining data for that part, that department. So in public works, we've got transportation related features like roads and culverts and bridges. And with the assessor's office, we've got parcel information um, and they're, you know, tracking and assessing for all the taxing districts. Then we've got, uh, you know, land use and zoning that our community development services department um, will be tracking as well. So, at the from the county um, we we take that information and we publish it out to the to the open data portal and and so it's a similar it's it's the same template that uh, Joanne showed you but um, at the local level and what the public can do with this is they can discover a lot of the information um, themselves. So we've reduced a lot of counter visits. So people that typically come in and they want to do some research for, um, let's say, a, a building permit. And so they're going to have to go in and check, um, you know, all kinds of things um, like the zoning and wetlands and, and snow hazard and all of these different um, criteria that they need to check um, for their building permit. And then they can actually get a lot of that that information here. So what we have is we have an open data portal and then we've also got um, a web mapping application that, that's specific to our county. And this is how they can get very specific information down at the parcel level. So we've got property information, um, all of the districts, all of the taxing districts that fall on that parcel. Uh, the public can go in and they can look at these taxing districts. Um, they can see, uh, you know, specifically where, you know, Kittitas Valley Fire and Rescue, what that covers. Um, they can check all of their critical areas um, to see, uh, again, do some of that that research themselves um, for that uh, that building permit information. And then we can tie that information right back to our uh, 
to our, our website so we can, they can go into the zoning. And this actually goes into to city of Ellensburg because we are within the city of Ellensburg. So this information that you can, that you can mine at the parcel level is served up as well through this open data portal. So we, are, we have PDF maps that people can download along with applications. So if they click on something like water related, they'll get all the information related to water. So whether that's a data set, right? So it's, you know, our shorelines or it's water mitigation certificates, um, or they can go right into an application for uh, water mitigation suitability. So our county is unique in the sense that um, we deal with lots of land issues uh, and we've, there's lots of renewable resource. Uh, so we have uh, solar farms and we have wind farms. And so there's a lot of uh, land use actions that are taking place. We've got lots of public land, um, but then we've also got some unique water situations where, uh, the Department of Ecology uh, put a, a, a moratorium on drilling wells and they did remove that moratorium, but those wells have to be mitigated by surface water. So this application will allow them uh, to go in and see whether or not they can receive an over-the-counter um, groundwater permit, for instance, where they can purchase that from our Department of Ecology. So this application is, is very specific to everything water related. Uh, all the water, the water related issues are, can, can become very complex. And so we use GIS um, to help uh, you know, make some of those determinations and some of those decisions um, related to water. So they can, they can find that there. When they go into uh, and find a data set that they want to download and look at, when they get a preview of that data set, um, they can look at that, um, those, those data tables um, here before they download that. And then they can download that information as a spreadsheet, a KML, which they can put right into Google Earth. Those of you that are familiar with Google Earth, and you can import a KML file into that. So you could add that layer right to um, the application that you're using or download as a shapefile. And a shapefile is a, kind of a universal GIS file format that um, can be imported into many different um, types of software. So that's what we've done with our open data portal. Um, we've also got uh, some other things that, uh, that the, you know, the public is interested in. Um, you can go into public works office, for instance, and you can purchase a road atlas. So I decided to put this in the GIS. So with any of these tiles, they can actually download a piece of the road atlas themselves um, and not even have to, to go into our office. So we can push out focused applications like this um, right from this, uh, this, this uh, portal as well. Parcel uh, table downloads um, are kind of a, a popular um, item as well. People can download um, you know, building characteristics. They can attach, actually attach this table right to the uh, spatial parcel layer to get more information um, about that parcel, whether it's sales or building characteristics. Uh, and then our most popular apps are down here that they can open up, which I just showed you with the, the road atlas and the water uh, mitigation suitability map. So current issues that are going on in the county, we can put these here for public consumption. And then I guess one of the main things that we've done at the county to help manage uh, forest fires is when we do get a forest fire in our county, um, I can work right out of the EOC with um, the sheriff's office and sheriff's deputies to define uh, where those evacuation zones go. And we can push that that map out uh, into an interactive map, you know, similar to this, to show the public um, where the evacuation zones are. They can even, you know, they have an address bar where they can type in their address um, to see if they're within uh, an evacuation zone. And then we can also push out additional information about a certain neighborhood uh, that could be on fire. So we work with the Department of Natural Resources to get the current fire footprint. So everything is live in real time. 
And the old way that we used to share that information is we would have to package everything up in those individual shape files and send those off as email um, for those maps to then be reconstructed. And so now this map is, is constructed um, on the fly and it's a web service that, um, that any agency, any state or federal agency can then attach and look at. And of course, it's, it's, it can be connected worldwide or, or access worldwide. So that's, uh, that's data at the, at, at the local level. So the information that the public would be um, interested in here will be lots of parcels, zoning, um, and land use um, types of data. Uh, and because of public records laws and public records requests, um, this is much easier for the county to disseminate information as well because of the water related issues that we had, um, you know, lawyers and their consultants can go in here and they can download um, all that data themselves. Um, and it saves, uh, it saves me time from having to, to fill those requests myself and package up that information. So I uh, will go ahead and pass it along to Bruce, who's gonna talk about um, some really good GIS work that he's done with education. Thank you, Jason. I did the wrong one. <laughs> there we go. Hopefully you can all see that now. Um, so it, as was mentioned, I work for OSBI and uh, some of the things we have available uh, first, like Jason was mentioning, uh, being able to download uh, maps from the county. We have a set of maps, uh, just basic information maps. Um, available at OSPI on our website. The one you're seeing there is kind of the new generation that I'm putting together. That will be available come supposedly July 1st when our new website goes out. Um, there are some currently available as well. So mainly, mainly what we have is a set of different size uh, maps that show the ESDs and school districts um, and a couple other uh, maps that are out there that are in PDF format that folks can download and either print locally or just use as a, as a PDF uh, digitally for presentations or just as reference. And we also, so on those maps, we use um, some of the data that, that we develop and, and maintain at OSPI. Um, and it's uh, basically data, of course, related to school districts. Um, so the school district boundaries, the location of schools, um, the educational service districts, ESDs, um, and, and a few other data layers that we're putting together. Um, one that's currently under development uh, is the actual school attendance zones, um, working on building a statewide layer showing all of the elementary, middle, and high school attendance zones uh, uh, for use in an application and for dissemination. Um, also on open data and we have all these these sets of data on the open data portal um, I would say they're in flux right now as I'm uh, kind of reworking um, the schema of these uh, of these data layers and updating the, the locations of things um, and kind of reworking through that one of the things that uh, we haven't done that much of except for one-off things is actual uh, online applications that are served to the public. So this particular application, which I'm calling for now Schools Explorer, for lack of a better name, um, it is one that is uh, serving up some of our basic information on school districts, um, school locations, and so forth. And so uh, this application also hits basically this, that same data that's sitting on the open data portal. I actually use that uh, URL uh, to build uh, the map behind this web application. So as you can see, uh, first comes up with uh, my annoying disclaimer um, that you have to click on, uh, but then the uh, uh, county boundaries, when you zoom in, uh, you'll see the uh, school district boundaries showing up and na the names of the districts. And then eventually as you zoom in, you'll get the school point locations and uh, labels on those. And you can click, so if you click within a school district location, which like uh, Joanne was showing, you get that additional information that's available 
uh, uh, through our data about that uh, school district. For example, what ESD is in, um, the, the regional transportation coordinator, uh, and also we have a link to the individual school district websites. Um, and I've gone through each one to make sure they work right now. Uh, so hopefully those will those will keep uh, keep working as, uh, as school districts sometimes change those. So you can drill down and get more information about those. You can also click on a individual uh, school point and get the basic information that we have in our system about that uh, actual school. I may add the websites for individual schools, but that might be a little bit <laughs> too much to manage and make sure it's up to date. So you have the basic information on the school uh, locations. I've also made available some additional layers. Uh, so let me zoom back out here real quick. So if you want to see much like that hard cut, uh, that PDF map I had there, uh, the different educational service districts, you can turn on that layer. Uh, and then I've added just yesterday uh, things like the legislative districts. Um, so you can uh, compare that with the school district boundaries or the school location. Um, and if you click on this, I'm, and I'm, this is coming from, again, the open data site, and this is these three that are start with SAEP, stand for Small Area uh, Estimate Program, uh, were put together by OFM. So I'm stealing their data to put on my map. Um, and they have uh, a lot of additional information, demographic information for that particular area. So for this legislative district, there is a whole host of figures on total population, household population, et cetera, uh, from 2000 up to uh, 2018. So you can do a little bit of comparison with that. Um, and the same goes for the congressional district layer. That has the same sort of information on it. Uh, if you click on an area and go to that layer's pop-up, and the same thing goes for this additional school district layer. So it's it's similar to what we have from the OSPI data, uh, but also adds the uh, additional demographic information from that SAEP layer that OFM has put together. Can I barge in just a second for you, Bruce? Yep. What I really like about this example is that it shows that not all of it came from OSPI, but we can still use it. And that's the power of these data portals. And if there was something from Kittitas County, we could be able to reference that straight off of the one that Jason was showing as well. And that's what I mean by that. Host wants, share often concept. Yeah, so we could basically mash up data as long as it's shared out there on the web and there's a REST endpoint that we could hit, we can bring that in. Uh, of course, there's other little issues, but usually we can, we can mash that up. Um, so a couple of other things that functionality for the, this application, you can enter an address. I won't say who lives here. Um, say so I enter, enter an address in Wenatchee, zoom to that location, and then you can explore uh, what schools are close by. Once you zoom back out a little bit, and what school district it's in, obviously Wenatchee. Um, and you can also change the background. So currently I'm using the light gray canvas. You can, if you like a darker background, you can switch to that or a street map. Um, or an image background. Uh, so depending on what you're doing, these different uh, layers may be better to have as a background. Um, also, I have a, a tool that allows you to enter a school district name. So I'll choose my alma mater, zoom to that school district, so you can easily search on that. And you can also search to an individual school as well. So I'll go to another place I went to school, although this is a different high school than I went to for one year. So if I want to go to the White River High School, I'll just type that in and zoom to that. Uh, you can also have it zoomed to your current location, which is might have a little bit of a bug in it right now, but um, but you can you can use it as long as you allow it to see what your actual location, current location, you can zoom to that. I would add that this is also available. Uh, at this URL, URL on any device. So you can bring this up on a smartphone, on a, on a, a tab, a tablet, um, or any device that you'd like to view it. Um, currently, this is still under development and testing, um, but uh, um, they'll be adding some different, uh, different layers and uh, working on the functionality of this as well. 
Um, one of the other applications that currently under development uh, goes a little farther than this, uh, which is you know, a school finder app, which I've had a request for that we're working on is it'll be a similar app to this, uh, but some of the things it'll allow you to do is not only enter a location, but also enter a grade level uh, that you're interested in. And based on the location and the grade level, it'll bring up a list of uh, available schools um, uh, for that area. Uh, and this is one of the big reasons why I'm trying to put together a, a, a statewide attendance boundary zone layer. Um, and luckily I've been able to uh, uh, garner some help from UW Tacoma, uh, uh, a lecturer there and a, a student that have been helping to put together some of that data because it is quite, a, quite an undertaking to try to put that together, state, that data together statewide uh, in order to use it for that application and, and some other functions. Uh, so with that, um, one of the things we started this year um, is the uh, high school and middle school ArcGIS online competition. So Esri, the, the main software company uh, that supplies our software for, for GIS, um, has the last, the previous two years, so this would be the third year I believe that they've done it, um, sponsored a nationwide um, competition for students. Uh, previous to that, Minnesota had run the same kind of competition just within Minnesota, I'm not sure for how many years, uh, and then kind of Esri kind of took it over, um, I believe in 2017. Um, so what it is, is allows students in middle school or high school, um, high school defined as nine, grades 9 through 12, and middle school as actually 4 through 8, so it could be some uh, upper level elementary students as well. And they need to choose a project, um, it can be on virtually any, su any subject they want, uh, it could be something related to environment, it can be social issues, political issues, historical subject what have you, um, and it, they are in teams of either one or two students, um, and they need to create a either web application, like I was showing you with the school finders, is a web application, or preferably, and what most do is what's called a story map. Um, and the story map is another uh, web application uh, format uh, or environment that Esri uh, has with ArcGIS Online that uh, allows you to really do multimedia uh, presentation of not only map data, but video, photos, linked to other websites, and so on. And in fact, what I have up right now uh, with information about the national contest, this is actually a story map um, of what I'm showing you here. Um, so they complete a project, and it can be um, uh, either as part of regular curriculum at a school, it can be an individual uh, student doing it on its own, uh, doing it on, on their own, as long as they're tied to a school and have a sponsor um, who's a, a teacher or administrator at a school that can then uh, submit their competition uh, to us at the state level. <clears throat> um, so each school uh, can uh, if they if they run decide to join the competition, can submit up to five projects to us at the state level. Um, if they have more uh, teams participating, they just choose the five best and and submit those to the state. And at the state level, so we have a um, a state leadership team, uh, which is somewhat ad hoc and voluntary. Um, uh, but what it requires, as it requires, is there being a, a state uh, coordinator or whatever we call it for the state team and an assistant. And so last year and this coming year, uh, I've led the state team and Joanne has been uh, assisting me on that. And then we have a, a group of GIS professionals from throughout the state, um, state and local agencies um, that uh, help with organizing things, trying to do outreach to schools, uh, and in judging uh, the submissions at the state level. <clears throat> so at the state, um, we work on uh, those tasks, and then when we uh, get the uh, submissions at the end of the year, then we choose the uh, five best high school entries and five best middle school entries, and they are awarded a $100 prize uh, each for those uh, five at each, at each level. And that, that, those funds are uh, donated by 
Esri each year uh, for the prizes. Um, and then uh, we also within that, we choose the uh, top entry for the high school and middle school level. And those two entries get submitted to Esri for a national competition. And then at Esri, at the national level, uh, they choose um, a winner at each level, at the high school and middle school level, as well as one honorable mention at the high school and middle school level. Uh, the winners at the, at the national level will also be invited to go to San Diego for uh, the large Esri user conference, uh, who's usually attended by 14, 15,000 or more uh, people from around the world. Um, and they also present their, uh, their uh, project at the map gallery during that conference. So this gives you a little idea. Uh, so they just finished up back yesterday announcing the results of the 2019 competition at the national level. Um, as you can see, Minnesota has the biggest, or Minnesota and California have the largest participation. Uh, we're kind of lumped into these 18 others. Uh, but it was our first year. Uh, we did have, um, so we had one entry at the middle school level and five entries at the high school level. So everybody got a prize this year. Um, so that was, uh, the high school was all from the Tesla STEM high school in Lake Washington School District. And the one middle school entry um, was through the Oasis uh, K through eight school up on Orcas Island. And this was actually a homeschool student working through that school and uh, uh, from talking to his mother, he pretty much did everything on his own, and uh, he did a, a very good job. In fact, good enough that he actually won the uh, honorable mention at the middle school level on the national level. So uh, that was uh, very good to have that. Um, he did a, an excellent job, and I'll show you real quick. So he did his project on the measles epidemic in Clark County. Uh, so he, you know, showing the location of that. As you can see with this, the story map format, you can have a lot of information here. Uh, there's different ways of, of um, different templates you can use depending on what kind of a story map you want to put together. Um, he's included a, a video uh, from a NOVA program, um, as well as the maps he's put together, uh, showing what counties there's been uh, measles cases. And then uh, uh, information on the immunization status uh, throughout the state, uh, what percentage of uh, uh, people have been immunized, uh, what the exemption pattern is nationwide, uh, and how that fits into the story. Um, and then one of those last maps here, he actually kind of follows through um, or follows what the what the timeline was on the outbreak in Clark County. So going through each location where cases were reported and giving some information on that. So he did a, a, a very good job, especially uh, mostly working on his own um, and uh, uh, very, very proud that he was able to uh, garner the, uh, the honorable mention on the national side of things. Um, So as you can see, so here is kind of the overall uh, view of uh, what they had nationally. Um, outside of us in California and uh, Hawaii, you know, most of the most of the entries are Midwest and East Coast. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see that that pattern. Some states that were trying to participate didn't even have, uh, unfortunately, didn't have any entries to actually submit to the national level. And if you go to this. <clears throat> excuse me, this website, you can see uh, the results from previous years uh, and, and what those entries looked like. One of the things I wanted to show, uh, one of the ones that I am most impressed with, so in this, uh, in this page, you can click, and if you go to the uh, honorable mention for the high school level, I was extremely impressed with. So they did um, a project on heavy, heavy metal sediment uh, in LA Harbor, in the uh, in the bite area, especially uh, this, I have connections to this because I actually years ago as a as an environmental historian working for a consulting company did a, a work on DDT contamination from the Montrose plant um, 
and, and looked at records from uh, from the uh, LA sewer system. And so this this one really caught my eye because um, they have maps on the on the outflows of the sewer system uh, out into the the bite area there off of Long Beach and actually the Montrose Superfund site. So a lot of this stuff is is coming heavy metals contamination uh, outflowing from various um, uh, Superfund sites in the LA area. And as you can see, this uh, this one has a, a dense amount of information. Um, they went out and did, they were able to actually go out and do testing themselves. Um, and they flew in a UAV to do some uh, aerial photography. Um, and I wanna go quickly through this and go down to their, I was also really impressed with their uh, poster that they have at the end. Get down there. Um, as soon as that loads up. Uh, but their poster presentation that they put together um, is really, really well done, I think. I haven't looked at all of it, but I, I think it would compete at a conference against <laughs> posters that professionals have done. Um, I think they've done a very good job of showing all the information in a very, uh, a very um, uh, readable format and, and conveying what they did for their project. <clears throat> so what we do, so at the, at the state level, um, we have, again, another story map to use as our, as our website for our state competition. And I will be probably by the end of next week updating this for the 2020 competition as we'll be, the state team will be meeting next week and set, setting dates and so forth to uh, launch the 2020 competition. Um, as we're trying to get a little head start on it this year, we kind of got into it a little bit late in the year, uh, last year. Um, so this site will provide information on um, uh, how to join the competition, um, what you need to know, the, the, um, the basic information. Uh, I have a, uh, and I'll reset this as well, a way for schools to register and show that they're interested in uh, participating in the competition. Um, some of the more general information about it, and I'll be adding some additional information on, uh, on this site uh, to show where they can maybe get training. Um, and we'll also be talking about trying to do some some Zoom web webinars uh, throughout the school year uh, for uh, providing them tips and so forth on um, how to join and, and things that we see now that we've gone through it this year, uh, things that we see they need to be able to focus on and, and understand uh, in order to you know, maximize what, the, what their students are, are doing. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out in this, and find which tab it is, now that I've lost myself. Um, one of the things that Esri provides is a, bun a software bundle, free of cost for each school if they want it. All they have to do is go on this site, um, download the software, it provides licensing for ArcGIS Online as well as um, the, uh, the desktop software that's available. Um, I don't think we really explained ArcGIS Online. Maybe not, no. Okay, uh, just a, a minute, I'll, I'll take, I'll explain a little bit. So ArcGIS Online is Esri's um, uh, cloud portal where uh, they host, you can host data as well as maps and applications. So it gives you a platform to load all this up and uh, create uh, applications that uh, can either be just visible to your organization or be visible to the public. And so that's the, the platform that all of these uh, story maps are, are hosted on um, and the data is hosted on and so forth. And all you really need is a browser. Yeah, so that's, you don't need any additional software except for the browser on that. If you wanna do some more sophisticated things with, uh, with GIS, then you would need a desktop uh, software program. Uh, and that's also supplied through the software bundle. Uh, there's also an option at OSPI, we do have um, basically the same thing hosted at OSPI, that if a school doesn't want to download their own software, they can use our RGS online platform um, for that as well, and just go through, through me to set up uh, the user and so forth. So real quick, it doesn't look like we have many questions coming through. Um, so we're probably getting, close on time for before taking some questions at the end here. 
I just wanted to show, show, quickly show the rest of our uh, state entries. So at the high school level uh, from uh, the Tesla STEM high school, uh, we chose a winner um, as this, applica this application on the state of Seattle's homeless. Um, so if we go through this story map, uh, you can see they, they gathered information, uh, demographic information showing uh, various aspects. Um, so I'm trying to remember which. So this map is on the concentration of homeless by um, census tract. Um, and then uh, looking at uh, data on mean income, again by census tract. Drug addiction, um, uh, number of people below the poverty line, looking at climatic factors, uh, how people deal with things, um, uh, with weather and so forth when they're uh, homeless. Um, so this was this was our top entry for the state. Um, and as you can see by by looking at these different uh, entries. Uh, we had a, a good diversity of topics. So we had the measles epidemic, we had the homelessness, so very topical subjects, um, uh, not just in the state, but nationwide. Um, and then one of our other entries was uh, on Pacific County shellfish. And you can see also there's different uh, templates that they can use for story maps, uh, depending on how uh, they want to present it, what sort of story they're trying to tell. Uh, so this is one on Pacific County shellfish, one on the salmon as an indicator species, um, and then one on the Yakima tribe. And another one on the Tacoma smelter. And we'll have links. Um, these links are available on Esri's national site, but I'll be adding these to our state site as well um, so that folks can look through that. Uh, and so with that, um, I will be trying to, uh, hopefully before the end of school here, uh, put together a webinar uh, and for uh, folks at, at, school, at schools that may be interested to kind of kick off um, our 2020 competition. Uh, hopefully have that scheduled here before the end of the, um, end of the school year. So if any of you know of anybody that's interested uh, and possibly, um, uh, participating in this, any teachers or, or others, uh, please have them reach out to me um, uh, and uh, we'll make sure to, to get in touch and, and help them uh, have the information they need to uh, participate in the competition. Okay. So with that, let's see. So with that, I think that's all we have. Uh, I think the remaining time uh, is open to questions if we have any. Okay, and if you have any questions, please go ahead and type them in the chat box and we can go ahead and read them for them. Um, I was just, does, does anyone have anything that they wanted to follow up with that they discussed today? Um, I had a question for Jason. You mentioned that you're using the maps for forest fire tracking. I heard this morning that your neighboring county in Grant, that they have a very significant fire. Are you going to be using your um, GIS information to help them, or is it just specific for Kittitas? Well, it's been specific for Kittitas County uh, back in 2012 when the Taylor Bridge fire hit. Um, that was right when Esri had released ArcGIS Online actually for, for organizations. And so we used it to fight that fire and it kind of garnered a lot of attention and people could really see the power of WebGIS through that uh, incident. And so since then, we've had a number of events in, in Kittitas County, a number of fires. And so unfortunately, we've got a, a, a fair amount of experience. So um, I'm actually scheduled to be going up um, into the Wenatchee area at the end of June to conduct a training for other GIS specialists from the four counties up in that area. So it'll be for Chelan, Douglas, Grant, and Okanagan counties and go over the tools that they already have um, because they're, they're running Esri software just like we
we are and how they can leverage um, those existing web GIS tools to manage uh, an emergency event. So, you know, the hope is that, you know, anybody that's, that's kind of struck with, with either, you know, fire or flood that uh, they can, they can use the, the GIS to help manage that event uh, more effectively. This current fire uh, and grant is probably a little bit early <laughs> for the, for the, for the training. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm certainly available um, to, to help out uh, with our neighboring counties when, when it comes to, to, uh, you know, with, with managing that event through, through uh, GIS web services, so. Okay, well, I don't see where anyone has any questions as, again, um, you have your contact information up. Is it okay for folks if they think of something later today to go ahead and contact you? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Great. Okay. Or is, there, is there anything more you guys would like to add today? This has been really interesting and it could be really exciting as a librarian. I could see where it could be a giant rabbit hole we could get lost down into too. Yeah, there's a lot of data out there, that's for sure. Yes, yes, thank you. Um, so I want to especially thank um, Joanne and Jason and Bruce for bringing this information about GIS to us today. And like I said, the, we have recorded this webinar and so it will be available later today on the Washington State Library training page. You're um, welcome to come and watch it again, listen to it again, or revisit it at any time.